Okay, got it. It's good, Josh. That's better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, is there anything that either of you'd like to uh, add before we get started, or should we just dive in? Ready to roll. Okay, good, good. Um, so we'll start off with, I guess, a very simple question, but also a very complicated question. Um, how would you define true love? <laughs> what does true love mean? <laughs> very interesting question. Most asked question. Most general question, most simple question, and most difficult to understand it. So love is a sentiment which we all have and we all have a need for it to be fulfilled. But we are never trained in it. We are never told what is love, where to get it, how to get it, what is the qualification needed for it? So I say that most of us have a lot of misconceptions about love. And because we have misconceptions about love, then naturally we unfortunately have a lot of failures in our pursuit of love. Because anything you want to achieve, any goal you want to be you know, successful in, you have to know quite well about that goal, where are we going. It's like if you go to some destination, you have to know which highway to take, you know, and you have to have a proper vehicle, car, you know, whatever. Maybe you have to walk, so you have to have nice legs to walk on. <laughs> so you have to have all these things, then you can reach your destination. But love is something which is in the air and we really don't know what we are looking for, but we have, as I said, just a feeling inside we have. And uh, in the modern science, they just say just some sort of hormones which start kicking in, but that's not really, okay, that's maybe some truth in that, but child also has need for love. And love is not always just romantic love. There are various types of love. There are love between friends, siblings, parents and children, Okay, mother and baby. There may, you know, in India we have also love between guru and disciple, you know, teacher and student. So there are various types of love. So what actually love is that it is a feeling where you want to be with the person whom you love. That is the first thing. If you really love somebody, you want to be with that person. And you feel a sense of joy just being with that person. Not even talking. It's like a mother and the baby is there. Baby doesn't, cannot even talk. Actually cannot do anything. Just lying on the cradle or bed or whatever, kicking legs. But mother feels so fulfilled and happy just by seeing the baby. Good mother, of course, there are some mothers who hate their own children. I've also read stories like that and I have met people who speak like that. But I'm talking about a normal good mother who just feels so happy. So just by being with the baby and she wants to be, she wants to cuddle the baby and hold the baby. And so this gives pleasure, just being in the presence. So that is the first thing. And second thing is that you want to do something so that the person whom you love, the object of your love feels good, feels happy. And you don't want to do anything which would cause that person disturbance, trouble, pain, suffering. You don't want to do anything like that. So this is the natural characteristic of love. And there is always a feeling of goodwill. Even when you are not doing something physically, in the mind, you always have a sense of goodwill towards that person. So this is the basic character, characteristic of love. But this is not how usually we understand love. When we are looking for love, what we are thinking is that somebody should love me. But that's not love. That, then you become, that's where the problem begins. So when you love somebody, it's, you are in control. 
because you are the one who are loving you are the one who are giving and you are happy to give that is another characteristic of love that love is just blissful when you have love for somebody you feel blissful by giving but in in the other case which is as i said misconception that i think i want it from somebody and when i want it from somebody then i become dependent on that person otherwise love is very liberating it is actually which gives you the freedom you feel that you are on the top of the world you feel as if you are not walking on the ground and i think many times people have had these feelings these moments in their life where they feel that just you know the world is shining wherever they look everything looks so bright and full of radiance enthusiasm mm-hmm. so this is the nature of love when you have love in your heart you're just blissful wherever you are in all conditions but most of the time when we are talking about love or i i, I want love or i want to love we are actually thinking that somebody should love me and then i become the object which i have to present myself so that i become lovable and then then i'm hankering and i'm looking that i wish somebody will come and fall in love with me so love has got two personalities in it it is a relationship love is a relationship between two people and every relation is that which has what you call the base and the object or the subject of love and object of love so when i love you then i am the subject of love which means i have love and you are object of my love so then my love will flow towards you and i'm just so happy to give it to you and do anything for you to please you and be with you and have that feeling of good love so just to give you a practical example because sometimes it is difficult to understand this concept but to give you an example when you are angry at somebody so when you are angry at somebody you are the one who have the anger and that person x is the object of your anger and your anger is flowing from you to that person and you have this feeling in you that feeling of anger that you want to smash that person you want to do harm to that person you will feel happy somehow to destroy that person do any anything which will make that person suffer even going up to the extent of killing that will give you pleasure so just as the anger has got two persons the subject or the base or the substratum of anger the person who has it and the person to whom the anger is flowing towards whom it is flowing the object of anger and the feeling is that the person who is angry wants to harm the person now you with this concept you understand love mm-hmm. that when you have love you are the subject of love you are the base of love you are the container of that love and the love is flowing from you to the person whom you love and just as when you are angry your mind becomes totally focused on that person so much that at night also you cannot fall asleep you are so angry when you are really angry at somebody you cannot fall asleep at night and if you fall asleep even in the dream you are having those anger dialogues probably with that person or doing something which you could not do when you are in the wakeful state maybe you are going to do it in your dream so the same thing happens in love when you love somebody your mind is focused on that person that person is always in your head you cannot get out that person from your mind and at night you are having the same you are thinking of that person if you when you sleep you are dreaming about that person so you you become like a planet and that person is like the sun you know like the planets rotate around the sun so like that you rotate around that person your life rotates around that person and the only good example i can give is the example of a good mother and a baby so those of you who have had a child or a baby of course for men men also have but nothing 
father does not have similar feelings as the mother has because after all mother is the one who has given birth and kept the baby in the womb for you know 10 months it's made from her own body so she has so much natural attachment to the baby that father does not come anywhere near to that but still those who are men and who have you know who have children they can relate to what i'm saying that how much their mind becomes focused when the baby is born and how they feel happy just to be with that and they want to do something to just you know spoil the child so to say in their love so this is what is called love so i hope i made my point clear beautiful yeah i i i like what you said particularly about how love is something that emanates from us outwards where so often we're looking for who loves me <laughs> um and that also leads me to another question is that is the importance there in finding self-love is that where that ability to emanate love comes from or is that something that we just can do or should be doing or should learn or how do, how do, that, how do we develop that sense of being able yes to so i would say that love is a subject to be studied as i said one of the misconceptions which all of us have is we think that we know what is love number one when my own experience is that most people don't know what is love i'm sorry to say it but this is my experience i travel all over the world and i meet people and i talk on love and people do not know it not only that they do not know it even when i explain they cannot get it why because they already have a misconception so then whatever i speak they try to interpret it from their own understanding of love but if you have to understand you have to give up your concept and just listen what i'm saying so that is one thing that it has to be studied what it is and the second misconception we have is that love is very easy to get you can have it just like that no it's not true and the third is we think that we are all qualified to have love no that is also not true we all have the potential to love we all have the potential to understand love we all have the potential to have it but you have to work on it just like we all have the potential that you know we can run but to be a good sprinter you have to go on the track and you have to you know take maybe some coaching also and practice it so running is such a physical thing love is something which is you don't it's not something tangible it's in your head it's, in, it's an emotion it's a relation so it is even more subtle and therefore more difficult to grasp i cannot show it to you running i can show okay you have to put your feet like this you have to keep your hands like this and you have to keep your neck and you know bo your body it can be shown but about love it's difficult because it's a feeling which you have it i don't see it so i only know it from your facial expressions from your actions what you do what you speak from only that i make an inference whether you it's like somebody is angry how do we know we see their facial expression their voice goes up their face becomes red they're speaking loudly their eyes you know flare up so similarly love also has certain symptoms when you have love how it you express yourself and how you walk how you talk how you look it's a different thing so it has to be studied it's a subject to be studied that's very important and it seems like a subject we i guess as you're saying we don't spend a lot of time studying and and learning and improving ourselves and right we sort of just leap into it as you yeah so what, what happens is that uh, you know as a, when we are born we we are ignorant and then we are suddenly out of the womb into this world and then we have our senses and we are just going around so we start ingesting information from outside and we are building up our own knowledge system we are like building up our own definitions 
and so many things, but in relationship with love. So in physical things, parents start teaching us. They say, okay, this is your nose, this is your eye, right? We learn this is my hand. So this is table, this is computer, this is chair. So we learn this because parents tell us these names. About love, no one tells us anything. But everybody is using the word love. We, we hear it, I love you, or you see it, movies, you read about it. So you hear the word, but nobody has explained to you what it really means. And it's not the only word. There's so many other words like that, which we use our, in our language and they're very crucial, they're very important in our life, but we never actually paid attention. We never learned what the word means. Just like computer, everybody knows, nobody has any confusion about what computer is. But in case of love, everybody will have a, have a different definition. Everybody has a different idea. So it's like I say that we make our dictionary when we are child, we are babies. And we make our dictionary in so many ways because parents tell, we hear certain things, we observe. So we only observe our parents, how they are dealing or other members of the family. And from that, we make the definition of love. So sometimes the definition of love which we have is actually just the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Which means that when somebody is giving me trouble, when somebody is exploiting me, then I call this as love. Because this is how I have programmed it in my dictionary, in my directory. So then I will look for a person like that in my life. I would like, want a partner who will actually always harass me. And if somebody is nice to me, I will reject that person. Because that's not my definition of love. But this is an illusion. This is not real love. It's like you, you want to eat bread and you have somehow misunderstood maybe a sponge for bread. So that sponge is not going to fill up your belly. It's not going to nourish you. Or some other thing which is not edible. Right. But it, you, you eat that thinking this is bread and you're completely convinced. If, if somebody gives you the real bread, you won't accept it because that's not what you think is bread. So you'll only go for that sponge which looks like bread and you'll chomp on it. But that won't give you nourishment. That won't give you satisfaction. So you'll you will feel unfulfilled and you'll always look for it. And whenever somebody comes with the real bread, that you will push up. And the sponge will give you indigestion. Then you have yeah, it will give you all, all types of problems. <laughs> so this is what is happening to many people, that they have a wrong understanding. And this is very deep inside. And they don't know it. And other people also don't know it. Because how do I know what you think about love? I don't know. So I will think, just like I don't know what, what is your concept of bread. What I think is bread, I assume that this is what is bread for you and for everyone else. But the problem is that everyone is carrying a different concept about love in their head. And then two people come together and they both probably have a totally different concept about love. And then they're trying to match it. It will not match. So then friction and unfulfillment. And then what you do is that you blame the other person because you think you don't know. Because you, you see that the other person is not matching your expectation and your definition. That's interesting. Well, I'm curious too, Jessica. So in your clinical practice, I'm sure you see this every day that you see, see clients. How do, how do you recommend to people to see the difference? Like what are some clues that you will have people look for to see, you know, when, you know, I'm sure you hear it all the time when people say, oh, I met this person and they're new and they're so different than everybody else I've ever dated. And they're, it's, it's great. And we're such a good match. And then time goes on. And then all of a sudden it's the same thing. And they say, oh, I realized I've been dating the same person again and again. And, you know, we, they, we do these patterns, right? Where you end up, you think it's a new person with different issues, but, but really it ends up being essentially the same pattern, right? Kind of as, as, as Babaji was saying. What's the, I'm yeah. curious what your experience clinically is with, with seeing clients with that. This is, it's probably the most common problem I work with, actually. And so, it, you know, because this is what we teach on, 
So when we're teaching people go, oh, that's, that's me. We tell stories and we teach, you know, and then, then they come and see me individually and we work through the same problem. So basically what, what I ha help them do is say, okay, when you are, when you meet somebody, you should have your list of red flags up front, not red flags about him or her, red flags about yourself. What behaviors are you doing that are dysfunctional that are going to end up hurting you? And very often I work with people who have codependency problems. So in codependency, it actually sounds very much almost exactly the same how Babaji described love. You're like, no, I love to give. I feel so blissful when I give. Yes, I felt that blissful feeling when I've been in love. That's totally me. Wow, I, I, I didn't realize how much I know about love. And that's, that's why this is so tricky. Because what he's talking about, codependency and what he's describing sound exactly the same, you know? And so, but in codependency, the problem is you're giving, you are staying up late at night and helping that person. You're even giving them your car, your home, your life, whatever, your money. Uh, you're, you're listening to them. You change everything for them. You'll move towns. But the problem is, is that you're, you're doing that because you're trying to get love. And it's very, a subtle point when I, when I say that because nobody realizes that. No, I just love them unconditionally. I'll do anything for them. You know, I'll change my whole life for them. I'll change my position. I'll everything, you know, but you're doing it because subtly you're expecting love. And so I try to help them see the behaviors, which are more obvious than the expectations, you know? So there's a whole book that we have where we go through characteristics of codependency and say, it looks like you're doing that. Why did you just, you're in the middle of getting your master's degree. Why did you just drop that? Just so you could like go on a date with this guy. Why did you drop your work? Or why did you give away money you didn't have? Why did you have sex with that guy on the first night? You didn't want to do that. We talked about that. So it's all these ways that you compromise yourself, you know, just to get the guy to like you or to get the girl to like you. And so that's what we look for. We, we make the list up front. Like when, when I hear one of my clients is starting to date, I'm like, okay, this is good. You're not in deep. You're not already in the marriage or you're not already five years in a relationship. That's hard to backtrack out. You know, so at the beginning, we make the list. But if you're already in it, we start looking from, from the beginning. The, because usually what happens is people come into therapy complaining about their partner or why they can't get a partner. You know, that's the typical thing. Or some relationship they're having that's not working. And so I try to turn it back onto them and look at these characteristics of what they're trying to do to get love. Although it looks like what they're trying to do to give love but it's really so, so they can get it in return. And there's a lot of uh, marks in between. It's not just that, it's not the obvious things I said. There's a lot of subtle things people do when it's like, no, what would I get, gain out of that? But then as we pick it apart, it's like, oh, you did that because of that, because of that, but why, but why, but why? Oh, you're trying to get love. And love is not just um, what we think maybe that somebody has sex with you or becomes your partner or something. Love is also attention validation, uh, respect. It's all these things that you're looking for, for the person to see you and, and validate you and your feelings, you know? So that's, we're doing all these kind of crazy things, acrobatics really, you know, and, and sabotaging ourselves to, to get love. Fascinating, huh? <laughs> so I think uh, I would just add a little to this, what uh, Jessica has said that uh, you know earlier you, you spoke about self-love so that's where the distinction lies between codependent and person who actually has love the person who is codependent does not have self-love they actually feel quite empty inside and they're doing everything to fill up that emptiness in case of love, the person feels himself or herself fulfilled within. And this love is an overflowing. That's, you can only give your something which you have. You cannot give something which you don't have. And in fact, you give when you already have enough that you don't need more than that for yourself. And just like if you have food and you have enough to fill up your belly and still there is more than you give it to somebody. But if you are starving yourself and you don't have any food, then you are looking for some crumbs, you know. 
little bit of morsel of food here and there. And for that, obviously, you don't want to look like a beggar. So then you put up a show that as if you are the one who is going to give, but you are actually looking for that just little crumble of that love. So, but you, you won't say that. And in fact, you don't know that this is what you're doing. That's the beauty of it. Because our ego is such that it never wants to look bad in front of another person. It doesn't want to be seen as weak and, you know, dilapidated or weak, you know, like it has no backbone, nothing like that. You know, ego is always that I am great, I am wonderful. So you, you portray yourself, but when actually inside, you're just starving. So that is the difference. So self-love is important. If you don't have just love for yourself, if you hate yourself, how can you love somebody else? If I hate myself, how can I love somebody? Charity begins at home, as they say. So, so first, I have to take care of myself. I have to love myself. And when I am fulfilled, then I can also love others. Then I can give myself. Otherwise, what am I going to give? I'm going to give my nonsense to others, my emptiness to others. So the beauty is that person A is empty, person B is empty. They come together and they think they will be fulfilled together. It's like two beggars meet or two hungry people meet together and they think they will have food. So it's not possible. So I want to add something about, sorry, that's very good. I want to add about something about self-love because in sessions, everybody thinks that they have it when I see people. And what Babaji is saying is so important because people don't know what self-love is. I say, what do you do? What do you do for self-love? And they say, oh, I get a massage or oh, I get my hair done. Or I go, you know, it's things like, or I, I, I read, I like to read, or things like that. But when, what I'm talking about for self-love, I mean, you have to take care of yourself physically for sure. But the, the point, that, the part that nobody has is nurturing your, your emotions. So we're all looking for love, and we don't know how to nurture our own feelings. So in other words, we don't know what our feelings are. And then when we have the feelings, we have no idea how to deal with them. So I do a lot of inner child work. And to me, that's what the self-love I'm talking about is. I mean, it's easy to, to make a program where people, you know, you exercise and eat better. I mean, unless you're working with some more severe cases like with addiction or something. But in general, you can work with somebody and make a nice plan for exercising and eating better, which is to the extent of what most people think self-love is. You know, taking good care of the body. But what we're looking for doesn't have to do with the body. It has to do with the heart, where your emotions are. And we're looking to feel fulfilled emotionally, which means somebody says, somebody sees how you feel and they validate that. They say, oh, you're feeling upset. You know, what's making you feel, feel upset? Or, oh, you're feeling sad. Well, let's talk about that. I see you. I see that you're feeling sad. You're feeling rejected. You're feeling lonely. Tell me about that. So because we don't see that in ourselves and we have no idea how to nurture that in our child who never got taken care of as a kid, we're constantly doing things <clears throat> to get other people to validate us. Like, we're looking for someone to tell us <clears throat> that they love us. That's just like, for the codependent, if somebody tells you that they love you, you melt, you just drop everything. That is like, that's, that's when you're so blissful because you don't love yourself. You didn't feel that love from your parents. So you're just, that's when Babaji's saying like the hungry beggar, it's not that your body's looking for physical food or that your body's looking to be exercised so that people have that wrong conception about what self-love is. It's emotional validation, which really we can only do for ourselves. Otherwise, we torture our friends, our family, and our partner. We torture them because we're constantly looking for that validation, and we're doing all these kind of crazy things to get it, the validation of our feelings. And when they don't do it, then we do even more crazy things. Do you love me? Do you miss me? Or we're looking for them to just... And then no matter how much they say it, it's like you know a pot with like a saran wrap over it. In other words, the water can't get in. You know, the other person's saying, yes, I love you. Of course I love you. Yes, I miss you. You're, you're, you know, you mean a lot to me. But they're pouring that into us and it, it just spills off the top. We can't receive it on top of it all. Or we say, they're just saying that. I don't believe them. When we finally like pressure them into saying what we want, then we still can't receive it. And then we wake up the next day and ask for the same thing. 
So I think it's important to talk about what self-care looks like clinically and self-love. Uh, and, and so that, that also draws me back a little bit to one of the first questions I asked about, you know, when we, we, you know, we seek out people that we think is such a great match for us and then later we find out, oh, I'm doing it again. What is the function of that? Is that a function of the, uh, the ego, the hamkar? That Like, why, why would we put ourselves, what function does it, is it trying to go back to heal this original wound that we do this? Like, why do we go back to these situations rather than learning and growing and, and, and evolving in a sense? Baba just so, got the answer to this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is very interesting. The, the reason for this is very interesting. And this I'm not speaking from modern or Western psychology point of view, but from Vedic psychology point of view. So from Vedic psychology point of view, and this is the explanation which we have is that uh, as a child, as I said, that we are actually building up our dictionary. Because when we are born, we don't know things around. Of course, there are certain things coming from past life because we believe this is not the only life we have. We have lived millions of other lives in the past. But those things are very hazy and lying somewhere in the background. So we, we built up our so-called character in our childhood. So according to Vedic psychology, by the time a child is, let's say, about seven years of age, 90% of the character has been built by that time. So by character, what I mean is the basic principles which will drive that person. What is the concept of love? What is the concept of anger? What is the concept of relationship? How the person sees the world? What does the person understand about mutual relationship, cooperation? generosity, all these things get built in to your system without you actually knowing it consciously. And how they get built in is again, as I said, according to the, your, your environment. So as they talk about nature and nurture these days. So nature is the external environment and that is actually nurturing you and building your system. So my favorite example is of computer, that in computer there is a hardware and there is a software. So hardware may be very good, but if the software has virus in it, then hardware is not going to say, well, forget about it, this I'm not going to work on it. No, the screen will still do what it's supposed to do. The keyboard will still function, the motherboard, the memory system will still work. But what you have fed into it, that's what is going to operate this hardware. So we have our physical body, the physical system, that's like the hardware. And then we have this programming, which has been done in our childhood, by our, primarily by our parents, and among them also primarily by mother. Mother has such an important role to play because the programming of the child begins right from the point of conception. Not, not when the baby has taken birth. It is actually going on. What the mother is thinking when the child is in the womb, when she is pregnant, what she is eating, what she hears, <coughs> excuse me, her emotions, they are already getting programmed. So if the mother is tense during pregnancy, the child will also have the tendency to be stressed out. So this is, people do not know, but our scriptures say it. They actually stories to this effect, written 5,000 years ago, that how the child heard something when the, in the womb and this had such a great effect on the child later on. And Ayurveda also talks about it. I think you have some knowledge of Ayurveda. So in Ayurveda, there is a whole chapter about this topic. So therefore, when you get programmed like that, then that's how you operate later on in your life. So it's not that you're trying to improve yourself or you're trying to get rid of your some, something else. It's just, this is how you are driven. When you're looking for love, you have a concept about it. That who is a person who should be loved or who is 
to whom I'm attracted. It's already inside you. You'll be attracted to that person even without talking. Among 50 people, you will actually have, you know, that, that sort of magnetic attraction towards that person. Because most of the time what happens, it is later on you found out that he's the same type of guy like I had earlier. So when you met and you talked, these things did not come out. How is that you end up with a similar type of person? Because something is happening at a higher level, at an invisible level. So that's what makes the match. And the other person also has a similar attraction. So they have done experiments, of course, that was a little bit more gross that on the basis of smell, that they had like 50 men sleep in their t-shirt without showering. And they did it for one week and they took these 50 shirts and then they got, you know, some girls to see which one they like. And they made a note of it. And then they got these 50 men and they made them physically met. They actually like the same person of whose t-shirt they like by the smell. So that means something is attracting to us to that person without even, you know, we are having any dialogue or even seeing the person physically. Because this physical manifestation which we have, this is also coming from our karma, from our past samskaras. Just like we know this very well that when we have a particular type of emotion, it brings a change in our body. When you are in love, your body looks, your face looks totally different. When you are in anger, when you are sad, when you are depressed, when you are in stress, you, you look a different person, you breathe differently, you emit different types of energy. So that wavelength which matches with your wavelength, it happens without you knowing it. So we have these patterns which are ingrained in our heart, which in Sanskrit we call a chitta. It's actually a substance. When we say heart in English, we don't know what we are talking about. Because obviously it is not this heart which pumps blood. When we say, he broke my heart, we are not talking about this heart because I'm still alive. My heart is broken, I'll be dead. So therefore in Sanskrit we have a specific word for that and that is called chitta and it is actually a specific thing, very subtle thing where all the memories are stored. And these experiences, we call them as samskaras and they got stored there and they are the one which build up your character and how you are going to behave. Your behavior is guided by these things, these samskaras. So therefore you will, get into the same kind of you know person because you will be naturally attracted to that kind of person so it's just like old wine in a new bottle the inside stuff is same what you're getting externally it looks different so you in the beginning you feel quite happy that no he's different he's different only externally but what is important as i said is not the hardware but the software which is driving the hardware. So you may look very beautiful and you are young and that, but if inside you have a corrupt program, you are a very angry person. And what is the greatness about that beauty? And many of the people of the world whom we call as great, they were not physically beautiful. I don't think Abraham Lincoln was very beautiful physically, right? Or Mahatma Gandhi, he was not a very beautiful person to look at if you see him. But he is considered as a great man. Why? Because the inside program was wonderful. Because that's what drives your hardware. You may have a car which has a very strong engine. The body may be broken and not painted. Maybe the glasses are... It will still run wonderfully. Because the engine is good. But you have a car which looks very nice. But engine is useless. So then it's not going to run properly. So therefore it is important. Therefore the work which Josika does in her psychotherapy is actually working at the level of these samskaras, these programs, like how to modify that. 
otherwise most of the time the thing which is done is that you try to change your behavior that's what modern psychologists generally suggest that just change a behavior this way that way you have to say i love you five times a day you know these kinds of tricks they will tell you and you have to bring a gift on this particular day on the birthday you have to do these are just changing behavior but this does not change the inner program so you can do that and it may work for a short time but it doesn't really bring that desired effect so i call it as cutting the grass that you know in america this cutting grass to me when i first went to america it was something like very amusing to me how on the weekend everybody just cutting grass so i said no oh. <laughs> you never see this in india no one does it here <laughs> so people people are just you know after their lawn so but you cut the grass and then after one week two weeks it comes up again you cut the grass so this changing the behavior is like cutting the grass and the type of work which jessica does is like removing the roots and replacing them with the other one so there are there is a grass and there are weeds you know you keep, keep on cutting these weeds they will keep on growing so you uproot them and bring the proper seed there so that's what vedic psychology does so that that was a question i was going to ask i probably should have asked earlier so it, that so with vedic psychology and jiva vedic psychology you're essentially digging into what you are referring to as someone's some scars are there deeply ingrained patterns and habits that may have come from probably their parents right or or life circumstances when they were younger and were and you're looking to to use your computer analogy i suppose like uh, update the software and and but first figuring out what your software is so that you know what program right. how to update exactly so first you find out and that's that takes time because it's not it's like you cannot see the computer and tell what are the programs lying inside no manual huh <laughs> right so you you have to only play with it and try to figure out what all is there unless you are a master of the computer and the common person has to go and play this run this program run the, but then there are viruses lying inside which are hidden and they pop up and you don't know where they are so yeah. this this kind of dysfunctional behavior which people have which give them trouble are like viruses so the job of uh, you know jessica is to figure that out that what kind of virus the client is having and then how to remove that virus and put a nice program jessica be honest yes. with be honest yes. <laughs> how painful is it <laughs> to pull out these viruses <laughs> very painful it's like going to the dentist and having them pull out your tooth with no novocaine probably worse than that and the worst part is you know it's coming <laughs> you know you know it's coming you know you're going to go there you know the dentist is going to yank your tooth or do some open heart surgery on you without any nova what's the novocaine you know the best i can do is some breathing essential oils but we have to go there you know and it's it's very very painful i wish i could say something better but it, what we're actually doing the reason why it's so painful is because one we've created a whole personality to cover the pain so the just say something happened when you were 3 and now you're 33 or 43 or 53 imagine all the years you've created a way to not feel that thing whole personality like why is somebody so funny you know those people who like laugh too hard or oh, everything's always a joke or is sarcastic they're covering a deep pain a deep wound you know or the people who are the know it all who never can ever be wrong they're covering also a deep insecurity that's a very deep pain of a parent making them feel ashamed so to get to the pain it takes a lot of work with the person's current personality nobody comes in and goes yeah let's do it rip out my tooth so it takes a lot of like them starting to feel understand the process and understand how good they'll feel when we've uprooted it and put in a nice new program you know but for them also to have you, you have to trust somebody and the whole reason that you have these painful some scars is because somebody broke your trust as a kid so now you're supposed to trust me why why would you so it takes a lot of time usually 
and it's very painful. But once you get to the other side, it, life gets very nice. Very, very, you feel happy, you feel healthy, you make totally different decisions in your life. You see things very clearly, but it, but it is very painful. And like what Babaji said, you know, usually if you're going to a, a, a typical, you know, just psych, psychotherapist in the West, they're going to work on your behavior, your thoughts and your behavior. Like, why do you think that way? And that's kind of faulty thinking. That's not correct thinking. You're thinking too black and white about things, for example, or um, you're making everything a catastrophe, or you're, you're always looking in the negative of things. That's fine how you think about it, and then you try to change your behavior. That works to a certain extent, you know, like cutting the grass, but what happens next week, or next month? You know, so you can change it for a certain time. It's like trying to, if something is straight and then you try to bend it down, it's gonna pop back up. You know, so until you go to the root of it, you know, which is where the painful stuff is. I'm not saying I don't also work at that level though. I mean, in codependency, that's not a root problem. Codependency is a symptom. So you also have to figure out how to navigate and live in this world. You don't go to the samskara in the first session and reproot it, right? So first, if you start learning about your patterns as well. So we also do work at that behavioral level because you have behaviors every day. You have thoughts every day. So it's, it's both, but I also just want to quickly answer your question because you've asked it a couple times, you know, and I answered it differently the first time, but I want to answer really quickly about why you pick, you know, Babaji answered from the samskara point of view, why you pick who you do. And before I answered how you deal with it, which is my part, right? The practical side, how do you deal with it? So we know that there's a program in you, your dictionary, like what Babaji said, of who you're going to choose. And it's going to be the same old bad wine, but just in a different packaging is how he described it, right? So the trick is, is not getting caught up by the, the bottle, the bottle of wine, like Babaji said, the body, but how they make you feel. So I'll have a client go, well, I've always dated businessmen who are workaholics, so they're too busy for me. But now this time I've got the yogi and he's so soft. We go to yoga class together. It's wonderful. And we, we do kirtan and he's into spiritual things. So he's like the perfect match because he's not at all like those business guys. That's just the bottle but the wine is still bad. In other words, they both are obsessed with something else other than you. The, the yoga guy, he's obsessed with yoga. He doesn't care about you actually. It'll play out over time and you'll see it. And the business guy's obsessed with business. You know, so if the tendency is to go for the guy who's the workaholic, you know, and then, then the, the client will go, no, but now this guy's even better. He's not into his work at all. He doesn't even work. He's at home all the time. What's he doing? Playing video games, addicted to pornography, something like that. It's, you have to understand how the person makes you feel instead of what their external packaging looks like. If the person is never validating you, which is usually the problem, because they either have their own issues in some way or they're obsessed with something or something, or maybe they have a sickness and now you have to save them. But whatever it is, it's somehow not related to them relating to your heart. So it's, it's looking at it at a more subtle level and not getting tricked by the packaging. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah and I'm, I'm wondering too, how does, I know we only have a few minutes left actually, um, so maybe I'll just ask this question because I was gonna ask about Sava Regis Thomas, but we'll save that because that's a, probably a couple hour discussion. Um, but is there any, any just really practical advice that you would give people who are in relationship, who want to nurture and help that to grow and to last and to thrive? How, what are just some simple things people can do that would, from, from a Vedic perspective to, I mean, we've talked about this a bit, I suppose, but I'm just curious if you have any real practical, easy things people could take away from this. Yeah, so I think the simple things is this, that, you should be very clear about your own expectations from the other person. Because as I said earlier, relation is means that which links two people. And both have expectations. So you have some expectations and the other person have expectations. So if you're very clear that what is your expectation and what is the expectation from the other person, because he or she also expects something from you. So if you're clear about it, then it will not be such a frustration because you know that this is what he or she is looking for you know, from me and wants me to be like this. And if you understand that from, and then you can think that, okay, I can work with this 
if somebody's expectation is something which you can never fulfill, then better not to get in such a relationship. But once you know, then you have to adjust yourself because both parties need to adjust to have a relationship. You will never find a perfect guy who will be doing everything according to your expectations. It will never happen because everybody is so different in this world. We all have different samskaras, different upbringings, different knowledge, different mindsets. So you have to give in and the other person also has, has to give in something. So it's like a business deal, frankly speaking, that I give you something and I want something from you and you give me something and you want something from me. So if you are also getting what you want and I'm getting what I want, then we continue in the relationship. But when I think that only you are getting and I'm not getting, then naturally there is a problem. So for this good relationship, understand the expectations and then you have to be tolerant and there has to be a certain amount of humility. These two things are very much missing these days in our society, but they are the golden rules for relationship. Anywhere, even if you go to work at your office and you have a boss, you can't be you know, arrogant. You be humble with that person and you have to be tolerant. He may say something, something which you think is stupid, but you keep shut in. But if you cannot do that, then there's going to be a tension. So if you can understand number one, expectation, number two, be tolerant, and number three, be humble. I think these are some very simple, basic, practical points which you can apply in your life. Try to apply it for one week and see how it works. I'm not saying that what I'm saying is right. Just do an experiment. And one week you decide that I'm just going to be like this. Be very tolerant, very humble with my partner or whoever is that, my boss maybe. And then see what is the outcome of that. So the thing is that it is you who have to do the change in yourself to have a good relationship and not expect the other person is going to change according to your will all the time. But we are all the time trying to change another person, which is impossible. And even if it is possible, even if you can change the other person, you have not changed. So your program, your virus is still there and it will still give you trouble. Even if the other person becomes nice, then you will be in trouble because you don't like that. Your program is such. So ultimately the change has to happen here within. And that is the meaning of self-love. And for that, I would say again the same things. Humility and tolerance. So that's my suggestion. I, I'll add one thing to that. To make to this practical thing, or what Babaji is saying for the self-love piece. So basically when we're, when our expectation is not being met, so it's very clear you understand what you're expecting, but when it's not being met, like I expect my, my mother to whatever, whatever, or my partner to whatever, you know, somehow meet my need. And when they're not doing that, instead of telling them, you know, that really hurt my feelings when you didn't do this. And what I need you to say is this, and that would make me feel better. You know, instead, that's still trying to get them to change. And then people think, no, but I'm doing healthy communication. No, you give yourself what you need. That's what I'm talking about with self-love. So when you're feeling like your expectation is not met, instead of trying to tell the other person, here's how you need to meet my need. So you can change for me so I can be happy, basically. You do it. So if you're needing someone to tell you something and make you feel good, you tell yourself. That's practical and that's hard to do. If you even try it, like Bobby, you said, for one week to add this piece into his three points, add this specific piece in. Every time someone's letting you down or you're or not meeting your need in some way or frustrating you, instead of doing all these things to try to get them to give it to you, you give it to yourself. And that's not easy to figure out actually what you really are looking for and how to get it by giving it to yourself. It's an exercise that stretches your brain muscles or your mind muscles. Yeah, I imagine. Even one week sounds very tough. <laughs> <laughs> but it's beautiful. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. So. Okay, well, um, I, I know it's we're, we're, we could probably keep talking for hours and hours, and I would love to have you both back again. We can, I'm sure there's plenty of topics we could get into, and I'm, I think a lot of people, um, you know, always have even more questions about love, especially. So um, I appreciate you all both being here. And I know um, 
that you teach workshops uh, various places, and sometimes right now it's probably not a whole lot of traveling going on. Um, uh, we'll put the web your website up on um, on this video so people can find you. But I believe it's jiva.org, right? Is that the best place for you? Right. Yes. Okay. And also Jessica's. And then Jessica Richman, the th therapist, is the it yep. is your website, right? That's the best. Yeah. On jiva.org, yeah, jiva there's a whole section of Babaji's lectures. There, He has lectures on loves, love that are recorded. So maybe you could also put a link there. I'll send you the link. But that would be, there's a lot of lectures he's done on love and relationships. We've done some together and then some many he's done on his own over years. And you can just buy that audio lecture and download it if you're interested on more. And I think it might be really nice at some point too to see, you know, I, I know you you tour and do workshops and things like that, but possibly maybe an online version you now since it's harder for people to, for you guys to get out, you know, maybe some sort of series of, of um, you know, lessons and ways to help people grow and, and, and evolve and develop love and, you know, true love and self-love and, and help. Yeah. It would be very nice too. So yeah. um, we'll put the links um, on the video so people can find you guys and I appreciate very much your time. I know we had to get you up early to do this, so. Thank you, thank you John. Hey, Krishna. Thank you. Nice Hi, Krishna. Okay. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, okay? You too, Josh. Thank you.